So welcome to the workshop. It's going to be quite hands-on. Uh, so I was wondering how many people have laptops and are kind of ready to follow on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So maybe I'll do it live as well. And if you want to follow along, that'd be great and do it yourself. That'd be, that'd be good. Um, so the topic of the talk is to look into what an L2 transaction is in the context of Arbitrum. So th there are a range of different L2s. Um, but the one we'll use today is Arbitrum, and L2 transactions will differ between those, but some of the concepts will be um, passed between them. So, yeah, so there's some differences, some similarities. Uh, we'll go into some of those, um, and I'll first give a bit of an introduction about what a rollup is, and that's what I mean by L2 in this, in this context, um, and then we'll go into uh, the workshop itself. Okay, so at a very high level, a rollup is uh, a side chain, just another blockchain, but it's connected to some sort of base chain by a validating bridge. And if you want to read more about this, there's a paper by Paddy who sat in the back of a room over there. Um, so you can get more information there. Um, and this is a kind of rough overview of how it works. So you've got one blockchain at the top, which is the rollup, you've got the main blockchain at the bottom, which in this case would be Ethereum, and they're both progressing via state transitions. New blocks are being made. Um, there's a bridge contract on the base chain on Ethereum, and periodically an operator will take the state of the rollup of the rollup chain and they'll paste it into that bridge contract. That once it's in that bridge contract, it can be checked. So in an optimistic rollup case, there's a flawed proofs that are used for checking that state. Um, and in the case of a ZK rollup, it's just a ZK proof. But the other crucial thing is that green blob that I've put inside the, the bridge contract, and that's data that's associated with the state transition. So you, on the, on the rollup, you need a, a, like a minimum amount of data to be able to recompute the state transitions that are occurring on the, on the rollup. So in the case of optimistic rollups, that's going to be the transaction data itself. And yeah, it just continues in the same way. And this would be the case where some data is put on chain, the fraud proof is checked, and it's found to be invalid. Um, yeah. So this is a kind of rough life cycle of a L2 transaction. So a user would create a transaction, they'd submit it to a sequencer, who would then be collecting these transactions into a batch. When the sequencer has got enough transactions, they'll compress this batch using some standard compression algorithm. In Arbitrum's case, this is Brotley. Um, and then they submit the, the batch to Ethereum. So that's this green blob is that batch there. Yeah, and another kind of difference between L1 and L2 transactions is gas. So as I've mentioned, L1 trans L2 transactions need to be submitted at some point to the L1, and someone's got to pay for that. So eventually that's going to be the user. And that, that cost is associated with the call data that is required, that is consumed by the transaction on L1 and is priced at the price of L1 gas. Then there's L2 gas, which is basically the same as L1 gas, the same gas that you know on Ethereum, but it's at the price of L2, right? So this is just the execution of the transaction that's occurring on L2. So you pay first to put the transaction on L1 and then to, put the and then to execute it on L2. So there's these two different costs and we'll kind of go into that in this uh, workshop. Yeah, so this is the URL. So if you go to this GitHub repo and you can start following down the, the set of instructions. So there's a set of prerequisites that um, include tools like Foundry, JQ, um, and Brotly itself. Um, and you can start following the steps yourself um, or you can watch me do it as I go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I've included some useful links at the top. There's some RPCs there to connect to both Arbitrum and to Ethereum. Um, and just some other stuff, some general information if you want to read more about like L1 and L2 gas and uh, some of the ways in which Arbitrum works that are relevant to this talk. Yeah, so these are the prerequisites. Um, Git's just there so that you can clone this repo itself. 
we've got curl for making some requests foundry for using cast cast is a kind of tool for helping you format um abi style uh functions for calling calling the json rpc jq just for formatting some json and brotly which is the compression algorithm that's used in arbitrum yeah so there's there's a quick setup stage i've already done this um i'll paste this in yeah just check those are there okay so the first step is the we're going to send a transaction on um l2 so i've already sent a transaction which you can use if you want um in your example or feel free to like use your, your own like metamask connect to arbitrum and send them uh, like a transaction on mainnet at the moment they're reasonably cheap i think so it should cost you only a few cents to do that if you want to but this transaction hash if we look at it on on arbiscan this is a usdc transfer basically so this is just transferring some tokens and that's the this is what we'll look into today um yeah so i'll set that environment variable and also feel free to like if you've got any questions at any stages as i'm walking through this just stop me put your hand up we don't have to get through all of this today so just you know let's talk about it and if you've got questions you know just put your hand up at any time um yeah so first we'll kind of grab a transaction receipt for that. And there's two interesting things in this transaction receipt that you might not be used to when uh, looking at L2 compared with L1 transactions. So there's this, there's this L1 block number, which is uh, the block number that the L2 sees of L1. So it's a kind of like L, the L1 is, it's reading the state from the L1 occasionally. And one of those bits of state is the L1 block number. You can access this as part of the Arbitrum EVM. And then the other thing is this gas that it used for L1, and that's what we're going to look into. So this is the amount of gas that was spent uh, to send this traction transaction and get it recorded on L1. Yeah. So we're going to store that in a variable. Oh, yeah. Okay. And I'll just echo that out so you can see like roughly what it is. So it's like 236,000 gas. So that seems like a lot when you think about just what what it's doing. It's storing just a bit of data on the L1. But the reason why it seems like a lot is because this is in units of L2 gas. So this is this has been scaled for what it would be if it was on L2. Um, and that's just to make the accounting a little bit easier inside the inside of Arbitrum. So this amount, we need to find out what the ratio between the L2 gas and the L1 gas was at the time this transaction was sent to then try and really figure out how much L1 gas was used. And from there, we can start to figure out as well, like, how many bytes of data it might have consumed. Yeah. So I'll store some of these variables as well. Okay, yeah, so as I mentioned, we need to find out this ratio of L2 to L1 gas. So the, the roll-up is, is estimating at any, one, at any point in time what it thinks the L1 gas price is. And it's a little bit more complicated than just reading the L1 base fee because there's a time lag between when the sequencer processes a transaction and when it submits it onto the L1. So it does some kind of estimating and it moves moves its price up and down depending on how accurate it's been in the past 
um, to try and make sure that it keeps even. Um, and so there's this uh, L1 get L1 base fee um, function, which is what was really used by the um, the Arbitrum virtual machine to, well, by Arbitrum, sorry, to to figure out what what L1 gas prices it should charge. Yeah. And there's a bit more docs here if you're interested in reading about like exactly how that works. Yeah. Um, and maybe we should go a bit more into that because I realize we're running quite quickly on time. Because I guess I thought everybody would be following along and there'd be lots of problems, but I'm a skilled pro at this, so it's going quite quickly. Um, yeah, so one interesting thing that happens with that with that estimation is that um, you, because because the sequencer is having to try and figure out what the price will be when it submits to L2, um, it's kind of a it, it ends up wanting to overcharge to not get out of pocket itself. So Arbitrum has a slightly different mechanism there, where um, the sequencer is rewarded later for exactly how much they spent, and there's a kind of a pool that sits on L2, and the pool starts quite full. And then the difference between what it was uh, awarded and what it estimated in the first place is then reduced from the pool or added to the pool if it overcharged. And then this, is you, this difference between what the pool target should be and what it actually is, is taken as a factor into the future estimate of what the L1 gas price should be. Um, so the sequencer never ends up out of pocket. They always get exactly what they paid. Um, but there is some mild fluctuation between what users pay now and what users pay in the future. So some users now might receive slightly less than what they ex like, get, get a slightly better gas price than what they expected. Some might get a slightly worse one. But overall, it's quite quite close to the average, quite close to what you should be getting. Yeah. Okay. So we'll call that precompile at. Um, at the block heights, so that for this we need an archive node, and we're going to call the the precompile at the block height when this transaction was sent on L2, and then we'll see what the estimate was at that time. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So. So you you want to know what the what the estimate was at the time that the transaction was sent. So you need to know what the state of the the node was at that time, and for that you need an archive node. A full node wouldn't be able to do this. Yeah. Say again. Exactly. Yeah. I think I think full nodes do keep some recent uh, historical states. I can't remember exactly how, but probably not a week's worth. Um, yeah, so so to do this kind of thing that we're doing now, you would need an archive node. But this isn't something that you might normally want to do. This is just kind of like let's go look at some of the analytics. It's not part of like you don't need it to for, to send transactions or things like that. And there are ways to get estimates for what these values are before you send your transaction as well. So you know what you're going to spend. You don't have to wait and inspect it afterwards if you want to. Yeah, yeah. I think there was someone. Uh-huh. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Yeah. Um it's not it's not a snapshot. It's just well, yeah, okay. You you need you need to know what the state was at that time because this is stored in state. This L1 base fee estimate. So uh, at a, at a different block height, the L1 base fee estimate will be different. And we want to know what it was when this transaction was sent. Oh, okay. Like in state, not a... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this, yeah. Yeah. So, like, what you're trying to do right now is choose your one fee, choose the gas fee, which you have to do with it, right? So the, se the sequencer has to pay some cost to put this data on chain, and it wants to get refunded for that. Um, so this is this estimate is 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 in the system it's under like you might say it's under consensus of the of the l2 and the sequencer is forced to use this value uh, in its estimate yeah um 
Well, the the currencies are the same. So the they both it's both ETH is the unit of accounts, yeah, on on both of them, yeah. But the gas prices are different, and they're moving. And this is just a wave to try and estimate that movement of gas on L one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's make make the score. Yeah, so this was an estimate of the base fee at the time, the L1 base fee estimate, which is about eight GUE, it looks like. So that's what it thinks it was at the time. And we'll store that in a variable. So as I mentioned, we want to work out this ratio so that we can scale the L1 gas used in from L2 gas units into L1 gas units so that it starts to make sense to us again. So we also need to know what the L2 base fee was at that time. Um, and this we can do by just fetching the block at that height and looking at the base fee uh, in it, which is 0 0.1 GUE. So Arbitrum has like a minimum um, L2 gas price, which is 0 0.1 GUE. Um, if it, if congestion happens, then it will go above that. But generally, it just sits here if it's not if it's not um, being used heavily at the time. Okay, so we'll store that as well. And now that we have these two ratios, we I mean these two um, these two uh, um, gas prices. We can use them to calculate the ratio. So have I stored this already? Yeah, that was above. Yeah. Oops. So there's the actual amount of L1 gas that we used at the time, which is a bit more what we kind of expected. And if we divide, uh, why did we expect that? No, a bit more like, not more than. Uh, it's it's like what we expect. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, it's a really great question. So you, you, we do compression over a, a full batch rather than individual transactions, which does leave you with this problem, right? How do I know what um, my transaction, how many bytes it will use in the compressed batch rather than in, in, in the other amounts? So what we do is you, it's, it's very hard to figure that out and do it fairly because it also depends on ordering and things like this. So what we... What we do is we compress your individual transaction when, when we give you an estimate for it. And so if your individual transaction is more compressible, you'll get a better, you'll get a better estimate for it and you'll, you'll be charged less. But that still isn't quite the perfect scenario, but that's the kind of like halfway house that we've arrived at. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and so each unit of, um, each byte of data on L1 consumes around uh, consume 16 gas uh, if it's a non-zero byte. So as an estimate, we can say that this consumed around like 180 bytes of data. Um, so we can then actually go and take a look and see if that's kind of what it did consume. So to do that, we'll RLP encode the transaction. It's got, I've got an error in my script there, I think. Um, this AABCC doesn't look right. Yeah, I was doing a bit of debugging. Yeah, 
so this script, what it does is a high level at a high level is just it it requests uh, transaction receipts, uh, takes the bits out of it which are important for RL for for uh, an actual transaction. Uh, RLP encodes it and just spits out the result with the 02 prefix, which is type 2 transaction. Um, so if we do that again, oh, not sure why that's. Oh, yeah, thanks. There we go. Thanks, Rigisha. Okay, and if we count those bytes, let me see, it's about the same. Yeah. So we spoke before about, uh, yep. Say, say that again, I'm sorry, I couldn't quite hear. Yep. So RLP is just the format of the transaction that Ethereum accepts. And then we'll include RLP encoded transactions into a, a big batch, and the batch will then be compressed with a compression algorithm. So RLP isn't compression, it's just it's just serialization. So I guess uh, if you wanted to access this from Proxy, is there a way that you could uh, you don't need to you uh, yeah, because what what you so what runs under the state transition is the full decompression. So when what you when you run the fraud fraud proof, you're bisecting on the parts of the state transition. So if the decompression is within that state transition, then yeah, you'll be able to decompress. You don't you don't need an implementation of the decompression on L1. You need it on L2, and you need to include it in the state transition. Yeah. Um, yeah, so let's try and explore the batch. Um, there's a uh, function on, on another one of the precompiles that you can find on Arbitrum to find the batch uh, containing a specific block, uh, which is this one. So we stored the block number earlier, and we'll use that to look up the batch. These precompiles, by the way, are they, they're kind of like the way in which Arbitrum customizes itself compared to Ethereum. So it needs to do some special things like this, um, and they've been added as precompiles. So you, they can be found at like different addresses um, that you can find at the top of the files. Yeah. So we use cast again. This is a little bit longer. Wait a minute. Oh yeah, there it is. So. 974 was the batch number. I don't know why I printed some rubbish, but oh yeah, it's because I copied the. <laughs> there we go. Um, yeah, it takes a little bit longer that one because we're doing. Oh no, no that one, that one's not the longer one. Okay, this one might be a bit longer. So given the batch number, we need to find the transaction that submitted it, and we need to look at the call data that was in that transaction because that'll be the batch. Um, so we need to find. Uh, the transaction. And we do this just by looking up uh, the logs that emitted this specific batch number. Um, yeah. So this is the transaction ID. So if we go to Etherscan, this is an L1 transaction ID. This is the batch itself. And if we scroll down and look at, oh, oops. So it calls this function add sequencer L2 batch from origin. And if we look at the original, this is all the batch data. So it's a large amount of data being submitted in one go. Yeah. Yeah, we can even look at this function in the code. So this is the contract, um, which is called the sequencer inbox. And it's where this sequencer submits these batches. Um, and this is the batch data itself. So we're going to try and grab that data and decode it. Uh, the way that um, the way that variable size 
um, arguments in in uh, in yeah in the EVM are encoded is at the end, and we and there is a placeholder for them inserted at this point. So we'll find this data at the end of the of the arguments list. Um, and given these are all fixed size arguments, um, we can know the exact position in them in that uh, in that input. Which is uh, well, first we'll download it actually. Yeah, yeah. Which is four hundred and fifty eight is the is the position. And we'll put it into a file. So if we open, so this is the raw batch data that we downloaded. Uh, raw is compressed exactly yeah so so yeah this is pulled straight out of the call data and this is what the sequence are inputted so it's compressed yes exactly exactly great question and we'll explore that in the step five yeah um, yeah. So, if we open the file, we can see that it begins with this zero zero at the start, and this is not part of the compression. This is just a uh, a type of the data. So there are some different instantiations of Arbitrum. One is called Arbitrum one, and another is called Arbitrum Nova, and they handle data in different ways. So Arbitrum 1 does this compression. It stores all the data on Ethereum. Arbitrum Nova doesn't. It stores its data with an, an external party. That external, those external parties sign that they've received it, and they put that signature along with like a commitment to that data on chain. And this 0, 0 here just tells us that the type of this data is roll-up data. It's Arbitrum 1 data. Um, so we want to remove that before we do the compression, uh, do the decompression, sorry. So we, we take those off and put it into another file. And then we just remove those, those front two zeros. And then this is the, uh, the commands to decompress the batch. So first, I'm going to convert it from hex into binary. Then I'm going to use Brotly decompression. And then I'm going to convert it back into hex and put it in a file. Um, yeah. And it outputs this uh, warning because there's some zero bytes at the end which aren't actually relevant to the the compression, but get added because of thirty like two hundred and fifty six byte words. Okay. So if we look at that, this is the actual batch data. And we can look at the size differences now between the, the compressed and the decompressed. Make that a bit bigger. So we've got this one, which is the, uh, wait, what was it? Which one? Compressed, which is 198 bytes. And then we've got the decompressed one, which is 715. So you can see the, the difference in the ratio there and the, the effectiveness of the compression. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. You. You. The, if the shared structure between different transactions, then they're going to be included into this compression and, and improve it. Yeah. Um, this is a bit of a. Um, the, the compression isn't actually this good, because this. If we look at this batch data, it can. It includes a lot of zeros, and zeros. Um, are charged at a different um, amount in in gas in the EVM. They're charged at four byte, I think four bytes, uh, four four gas per byte rather than sixteen for non non zero bytes. And the compressed batch will be almost no zeros in it. There'll be there'll be much more like a tenth of them are zeros, right? Rather than oh, a sixteenth. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
So it's it's not quite as good as it's showing here, but it's still quite good. You can work it out by like doing some more complex analysis, but we won't do that here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we've compared those. And then the last thing to do is that our transaction should be in that uncompressed batch. So we'll go and try and find that. So if we echo the the RLP, um, I think I had it in raw maybe. Let's see where I had it. Oh. Yeah, I did have it in RLP. Oh, a TLP I've written. Yeah, so this is our transaction. If we go into the batch. And there it is. So along with a load of other transactions. Yeah, and that's basically it for the workshop. So if you've got any more questions, yeah. Yeah, you can you can do that yourself as a, a developer. So the, on Arbitrum, there's a registry where you can register address against an index, and then you can substitute them, and Arbitrum will know that you've done that, and it will then um, switch them back out when it comes to execute. And in that way, the sequence will charge you less for your gas, yeah. Yeah, because when when you're compressing um, the addresses in in a batch, then it does a lot of that for you anyway. Like so, it, the two yeah, it's one one was like a, a legacy system where we would do we would allow users to do this themselves, and now like the whole holistic batch way achieves a better result. Yeah. Uh, do you have a second question? Yeah. Can everybody hear the questions? By the way, or should I repeat them? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So is there an um application that you can use uh no, there's not. So like Optimism used Zlib, I think, and we went for Brotly. And the reason was is because we did some analysis of different compression algorithms and we found that Brotly performed best. Um and I guess they did a similar sort of thing and chose Zlib for their own reasons. Um yeah, I don't know. I don't know how important it is to standardize this specific part of the rollups because it's it's something that users shouldn't really be interacting with generally. Um, and I think that's the most important part to standardize. Um, but yeah, it would be interesting to to see why they chose those that as well. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I didn't repeat the question. He, he asked if there would be uh, if there's any efforts to standardize this compression algorithm. Yeah. Um, up to, across different L2s. Uh, yeah. You mentioned earlier that you need a registry. <laughs> yes, yeah. So there's an address registry that you can use. You you register an address against an index, and then that will be used when up on execution. You, you substitute your indexes into your transaction, and then they will be desubstituted from the registry upon execution. To reduce the amount of call data that even goes into the batch itself, yeah. Um, it should be. Mm. 
So we used to have it in our docks. We've just recently revamped them and I'm struggling to find it, but we did used to have it there. Do you know where it might be, Dragish or Fred? Arbitress registry. So we've got arbitress table here, which is the Yeah, so this is like a bit of documentation, but I'm sure we had some more documentation about actually how to use this contract and pre-compile, didn't we? Okay, maybe we can do this afterwards as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, what, do I just see, you know, behavior and operations? Uh, Arbitrary and Arbitrary is working out the operations. Yeah, so the, the compression, the Brotley compression was part of Nitro, um, exactly. It was one of the major parts that reduced the cost. Previously, we didn't compress at them. Yeah. 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 Um, I was curious why the uh, hard coded minimum base fee. Yeah. So the question was uh, why the hard coded minimum base fee? Um, and I think that's partly just to avoid like us um, getting loads of state bloat early on for very cheap price. Um, Given that we may expect users to come on board onto the platform and the gas price not to always sit there, it would be good to not, the future not to be burdened by that kind of legacy behavior. Yeah. 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 So the question was the execution occurs on layer two. So what's happening on layer one? What are we putting there? Yeah, you you just store the data such that there's an, there's enough data there so that anyone who's observing Ethereum can recompute the same trans, state transitions that are occurring on L2, and that's important so that anybody can 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 take part in a fraud proof um, uh, game. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we have two ways of doing it. So the, I'll, I'll open up that contract again. Uh, the question was, um, uh, in, the, in the contract, do you need to emit all of the data, the batch data in an, in an event, or can it just be in the call data of the transaction? Uh, yeah. So there's, we have two functions for that. One is uh, submitting it from origin. And in this case, we know that the that it's being sent from the transaction origin, and therefore we know that the call data is going to look like this. So if we know that, then the L2 can reliably grab data out of the call data. If the sequencer is, you know, going via some other contract or it's not coming from the transaction origin, then we emit the full uh, batch data in an event. So in production, this, this so this is here. If, if if it were needed, but in production, it's way more expensive, so it's never used. Is it, sorry, what, why do we not need that in the, the first table? Why do we not need what? Sorry. Yeah, so to clarify on, on what we're doing here, we're emitting a sequence number. Um, and what the L2 node will do is it will say, okay, I've got a new sequence number. I'll go look up the the transaction related to that sequence number i'll look inside the call data i'll find the batch basically the same process of we as we've just done and all of that all doing all of that is part of that state transition function so it's all yeah yeah um, yeah yes execution happens on layer two yeah and state is on layer two as well, yes. So, part of the transaction was all data on layer one. I assume that in this contract, nothing is being executed. Is this data on transaction or just the state? Sorry, I missed a bit. You said there was. So, let's say that I send a transaction that I send some tokens to the state. Yep. Does this happen in layer one as well? Uh, no, so the question is, is, does the execution also take place on layer one as as well as on layer two? And no, it doesn't. We just put enough data such that anyone who's reading 
the Ethereum can then go away and recompute themselves what would have happened and take part in this fraud proof game. Correct. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You need so so yeah. To if you want to know what the state of the L2 chain is, you need to replay the history of the chain in the same way that you would replay the history of L1 to figure out what the state of L1 is. Is there a way to ask an L1 may have blocks of artists that have some transactions for this address, or I have to pass all your contract transactions of two that by come? Yeah, so the question is, is, can I find out states about a specific address without recomputing the full state on L2? And the answer is no. So the state only exists on L2, and that's only where you can make questions about the state. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so the question is, can you sort of game the system, uh, take advantage of this, of this minor fluctuations in L2 gas price to try and achieve a better price for yourself? And the, the answer is yes. Yeah, you can. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so I think that's that the question there that comes down to a little bit around your security assumptions. Um, so in order for the state to in order for you to be confident of Ethereum state, uh, you want a wide range of people to run full nodes such that if an invalid state transition occurs, a, a large number of people can get together and form consensus that that was an invalid state transition. That should be a rejected fork and we shouldn't ignore it. But with uh, Rollup, there's, there's a slightly different um, safety assumption, which is that if any single one person uh, notices that there's an invalid state transition, then that one person can enforce that the state transition is, is corrected. So it's, you don't need a large number of people necessarily. You, you, it's a kind of one of many, one of N security assumption rather than like an N of M. And so this means that maybe you can afford to have less people actually running the L2 nodes. Yeah. And, and, in, and so have maybe slightly more beefy machines. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we can go into it. Yeah, sure. Uh, so the question is, is like how how in practice the fraud proofs work? Okay. Yeah. So two parties take place in uh, a fraud proof game to figure out which of them has chosen the correct state. And then one of them wins, which is what you what you're asking about. And at that point, that state is the, the losing state is rejected. More people can challenge the winning state if they want to, but the losing state is rejected. Whoever chose to uh, take part to, to defend that side of the state will lose some stake because you have to put at stake to defend a, a, a state. Um, and the if no one if no one comes to challenge the winning state then that will be accepted as the correct state and you'll go on from there. And does the L2 call? No, the L2 doesn't, the L2, so 
if you're running an L2 node, you've got your, if you think about a fork occurring on Ethereum, you've got some people that choose different rules for their node. That doesn't mean that you need to stop running your node with the, what you see as the correct rules. And the same kind of happens on L2. I can run my node and I can see which of those two is going, is going to win the challenge because only one of them is correct and I know which one of them is correct. So I can continue to accept transactions, validate them, and we can continue to process them in that time. What you can't do during that period is withdraw funds from the system. So if withdrawals are paused whilst this fraud proof game is taking place because Ethereum itself doesn't know which of those two states is going to be correct. So the funds stay in the system while it's happening, but we can still progress the state uh, as, an, as an external viewer. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So the question is, is like if two 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 states are in violation of each other, there's people defending either side. Um, what is the what are we actually challenging? Where what's the state transition that we're challenging? Is it the pre is it from the previous state to the current state, or is it further back? And the answer is, it's just the previous assertion. Yeah. So, so, so the question is, do, do the fraud proofs take place in the solidity contract? Uh, and yes, they do. But the way they, the way they work is that there is a bisection game that the two parties play. We don't want to execute the full state transition again. So instead, we try to decide which part of the state transition we disagree on. So we take the state transition, we bisect it into many parts, and we allow the other person to choose which part they disagree with and which part they agree with. And so you always, you have, you're reducing the size of the state transition, always keeping a point that you both agree on and always keeping a point that you both disagree on and making that smaller and smaller and smaller until you get down to a single uh, opcode and then you execute that single opcode. Yeah, yes. So what if you two parties disagree on multiple uh, measures of states or um, points? Would they have to um, make efforts off of on um, different measures? So is the question that within a single state transition, they disagree about multiple things, or is it that there are multiple people disagreeing about one? Okay, so if there's two, two parties, but they disagree about multiple things, then it'll just be the first disagreement that matters because that's all you need to, to slash the person out of the system and remove their, their uh, state from the system. Yeah. Uh, yes. So, I think your question, I think, is what happens if someone includes an an invalid transaction in in the batch, or so so the Arbitrum virtual machine will know what to do if someone gives in an invalid transaction. It will ignore it basically. So you can then choose to run a different Arbitrum virtual machine that would do something weird with that. And then we would end up at different states and we would like challenge each other over, over the result of that. But just including an invalid transaction in the batch isn't enough to like confuse uh, an honest validator that something weird has happened or that they've got the wrong state or anything like that. The, there are rules about what to do for every byte that you see in that batch. I think, sorry, there's one at the back first, sorry. <laughs> How long do we have left? <laughs> uh, these are great questions, though. Yeah. So the question is, oh, sorry, you did. Yeah. So the the question is, um, given that uh, 
during a, a fraud proof game, withdrawals are paused. Isn't there an attack you can do on the system to delay and cause problems for everyone else by just creating a challenge? And what is the cost of that, of creating that challenge? Um, and, the, and the answer is dependent upon how high the stake is set. Um, so that's, yeah, if, if you have a very high amount of stake, then it becomes very costly for you to cause this delay. Pardon? The the amount of state is stake is set by the system. So for in order for you to take part in a challenge, you need to put up a certain amount of stake. Yeah. So at the moment, the validator list is whitelisted, so it's not open to the public. So the, so whatever value in there is is not really meaningful. But we're working quite hard on trying to make that open. And when it is open, I can say that it will be quite expensive. Uh, yes. So there's a separate. So the question is: Is what if the sequencer is malicious, tries to cause an invalid state transition? Is is that the yes. right? And what happens when someone challenges? So there's there's a separation in the system between uh, sequencing transactions and generate executing those transactions to create a state, to update state. So the sequencer has no power over what state will be updated, what the state will be based on what it puts there. The node software does. So if the sequencer puts rubbish there, the node software, like um, honest node software, will recognize it as rubbish. If the sequencer puts valid stuff there, then they will process it as valid stuff. But the sequencer is all it's doing is putting data onto the chain. They don't enforce in any way what the state should be that's a result of that data. Those are the validator nodes that decide that. Yeah. So given just some data that arrives, people running validator nodes need to decide what the result of that data would be. Yeah. Does that kind of answer the question? Yeah. Yeah. And the nodes will know what to do when they receive that. So there'll be strict rules about everything that the the batch contains. Yeah. Uh, exactly. So the question is is like what can this what powers does the sequencer have in the system? And the sequencer can choose ordering of of things inside that batch. Um but they can't m manipulate what the output of those transactions will be. Yeah. So you don't you don't trust them in any way for the security of the system. The sequencer is is necessary for liveness live, liveness of the system to get transactions moving. <laughs> Fred's like waving his hand over there. Like, <laughs> but, follow up with that saying, um, are there any uh, checks on the sequencer by the validators? Like you mentioned, the validators will recognize the rubbish, but what can they do at that point? Yeah. So. At the moment, there aren't, right? So at the moment, we trust the sequencer to behave well. If they don't, then we won't be able to use the system properly. It, the, the funds will still be safe that are in there. And there's a secondary backup system which normal users can use. So you don't have to go via the sequencer if you don't want to. But you, you don't get the benefits of compression, but you can send your transaction yourself, um, or you can find another someone willing to compress stuff for you and put it into uh into the system for you but they they won't fundamentally the sequencer is the one who chooses the ordering and you won't be able to do that um we have like a, a wait a time period where if the sequencer is not actually doing its job at all if it's not updating things or it's not including these what we call delayed messages which are user sent messages via the l1 then after a time period you you can force those through regardless of the sequencer so that's the kind of backstop if you need to exit the system and the sequencer is not allowing you to send transactions. Yeah. But it's not really the validators that are 
involved in that. It's more the users who say, okay, I don't like the system anymore. It's not working for me. And I want to just force my way out of it. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, so that, that comes back to uh, your your um, your node software, right? So if you if you can see that this state is correct, then if oh sorry, yeah, yeah. So the the, the question was is like what how does finality work in the system given that after a fraud proof a certain state will be rejected? Um, so the answer is if you are following that invalid state then you will basically see a reorg, probably quite a deep reorg. Um, but if you were running honest software, you won't, see an, you won't see any problems, basically. You won't see any difference. There'll be no uh, change. Yeah. But you can, but that does bring into question what the finality of a transaction is in, in there. And as you, as you pointed out, you could get this deep reorg. So it depends whether you're running software. It depends like whether you're running node software or not. You might want to wait just until that weak period is up, all challenges are over, and then just be like, okay, now it's definitely fine. Yeah. Um, yeah, any more questions? Uh, the question is, is there an easy API that I can use to see if, there are, if the challenges are complete? And the answer is that you can look in the smart contracts. So you, the smart contracts are created and destroyed when challenges exist. Um, so you can see in, in the smart contracts all the challenges that are taking place at any one time. Uh, yes? So, uh, if you, if you have an invalid state, do you start building off of that with every state that's not invalid? Yes, it will. How would you ever? Like, how you if, ever if you, if you, um, are, if you think that, if, you're, if your node software has a bug in it, or you've done something malicious with your node software, then you'll be following what will no, will not be the canonical chain eventually. And so you'll see results that will not never happen or, or may happen in a different way. The transactions will still be replayed. So you, all the transactions are on L1. So anyone who wants to run honest software can know what the final state will be. But if, if you're running some sort of like uh, mutated software or something like that, then yeah, you, you do, after one week's time, you may find that all of that state that you thought existed didn't, and you're actually on this other yeah, I, chain. My question is like, how do you get out of that situation? Where we're, we're on the back of the invalid state. I don't know exactly how to phrase this. The the question is like, like what? The question is, well, what happens to me when that challenge ends and and I realize that I was following the, the wrong chain? Is that the question? Yeah, basically. I, I, okay, so the challenge ending is where... Yeah, the challenge ends. No one decides to dispute this state transition. Basically, everyone in the world is agreeing on this state transition at this point. If they didn't, and they would start challenging it. Okay, um, I've got to wrap up now. But thanks very much for the great questions. And uh, yeah.